This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Very good afternoon to everybody. Um, I am Maxine Molyneux, I'm the director of the Institute of Study in Americas, <coughs> and it gives me great personal pleasure to introduce uh, Victor Bulma Thomas, Professor Bulma Thomas, to you, a most distinguished economic historian who holds a spring of honours among the CBE, an OBE, and others from Colombia and Brazil, awarded for his outstanding contribution to Latin American and Caribbean scholarship. Few of us here will not have come across his work on the region's economic history, work which covers a formidable range of topics, countries, and periods of history. The two-volume Cambridge Economic History of Latin America, which he co-edited and contributed to, is now in its second edition, and as a sign of the times, it's also translated into Chinese and Japanese. And we can all welcome his new magnum opus, The Economic History of the Caribbean Since Napoleonic Wars, which has just been published by Cambridge and will soon be in our libraries and on our shelves and reading lists. As many of you know, Victor has a special place in the history of this institute as he served as director of ILAS, the Institute of Latin American Studies, from 1992. He was director when I joined ILAS two years later. I came from Birkbeck in 1994, and I can say that he has always been an unfailing supporter of the mission the original ILAS to actively promote research and teaching on Latin America, a mission to which he's contributed so much and continues to do so. So for all these reasons, I'm extremely delighted to have Victor conclude this year's very successful series of workshops on liberalism in the Americas. This will in fact be the last workshop that the present academic team will organize at Senate House as we're moving to UCL in July to set up a new Institute of the Americas there. And Debbie Turner, who's done such a magnificent job, thank you Debbie, running the program, will be taking up a permanent post at Leicester in October. But we plan to contribute to work with Debbie and all our colleagues on the Liberalism in the Americas project to develop a new program of activities in the new year. And we hope that you'll join us for that and also for the lecture that we've organized uh, by Jeremy Edelman uh, which will be held at SAS as part of the Liberalism in the Americas project in November uh, of this year. So without further ado then, let me hand over to Victor, whose talk is entitled Freedom to Trade, Free Trade and Laissez-Faire, Latin American Approaches to Economic Liberalism in the 19th Century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxine. Very generous of you. Liberalism in Europe had many dimensions, one of which, especially in the United Kingdom, was the degree to which the market should guide all economic decisions. In Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, the hidden hand of the market was seen as leading to a big improvement in welfare when compared with the myriad rules and regulations imposed by central governments on their citizens. When David Ricardo developed the law of comparative advantage in his Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, it became a rallying cry for liberals of all persuasions. The end of the tariff on basic grains in 1846, better known as the abolition of the Corn Laws, was considered a major achievement of liberalism in Great Britain and a model for liberals elsewhere. It might have been expected, therefore, that liberalism in Latin America would have paid equal attention to trade policy, the end of state monopolies, and the promotion of competition. Smith and Ricardo were well known in Latin America, and their works were widely read. However, liberalism in 19th century Latin America focused primarily on relations between church and state, the degree of personal freedom from state interference, and the constitutional arrangements between central and local governments. The arguments for economic liberalism were much less compelling in Latin America. Indeed, liberals in power were often less, quote, liberal, unquote, than their conservative opponents. There were many reasons for this but the most important were the limitations imposed on economic policy by the demands of state finance, the behavior of trade partners, and the difficulty of finding fiscal alternatives to tariff revenues. Thus, unrestricted free trade was seen as a distant goal by all but the most ideologically committed liberals, 
an economic focus policy focused on much more limited objectives. The first of these objectives was, quote, freedom to trade, unquote, meaning the right to trade with any partner in the world, even on unequal terms. Once that was achieved, the goal became an international trade that was exempt from discriminatory policies by the partner country, rather than subject to zero or low tariff rates in Latin America. This was, quote, free trade, unquote, Latin American style, and it had been largely achieved by the second half of the 19th century, with a large degree of consensus among all members of the political elite. What remained was a series of arguments about the markets for labor, land, and capital, where there were genuine differences among the elites, and where Latin American liberalism partially found a voice. This was not laissez-faire in the classic sense, but a debate about the degree of state interference in the factor markets to maximize the opportunities for economic growth and development. Not surprisingly, disputes rarely crystallized neatly along party lines, so that Latin American liberals could be found on occasions arguing for policies that would have puzzled economic liberals in Europe. The system against which, quote, freedom to trade, unquote, struggled was mercantilism. In addition to its well-known features of maximizing the trade surface of the country concerned in order to accumulate specie, i.e. gold and silver, mercantilism, when exercised by imperial countries such as Portugal and Spain, limited the number of ports that could be used, imposed numerous restrictions on intra-colonial trade, and prohibited the use of foreign ships. In those rare instances when trade with foreign countries was permitted, discriminatory tariffs were applied to prevent it reaching significant proportions. The mercantilist system applied by Portugal and Spain to its colonies in the Americas faced numerous challenges even before the publication in 1776 of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. One was the impact of imperial wars, which meant that the colonies could face extreme shortages at times of conflict. Another was natural disasters, which could necessitate a more urgent response to essential needs than that permitted under the colonial trading system. A third was the contraband trade, which became ever more profitable as additional restrictions were added to the mercantilist system. The occupation of Havana by the British in 1762 had emphasized the contradictions of the mercantilist system, while creating a constituency in Cuba that had tasted the fruits of enlarged trading possibilities. The following year, in 1763, the Dutch had thrown open some of their ports in the Caribbean to the ships of all nations, provided, of course, they were not at war with the Netherlands. And this raised the prospect for the Spanish of an increase in the contraband trade. When this free port system was adopted by the British for the islands of Jamaica and Dominica, a Spanish response became a matter of urgency. This duly happened in 1778, although the rules for the Spanish Caribbean islands had been relaxed even <coughs> earlier. In that momentous year, the Bourbon Spanish Emperor Charles III passed the Reglamento para el Comercio Libre, allowing a greater number of ports on both sides of the Atlantic to participate in the imperial trade that had previously been channeled almost exclusively through Cadiz on the Iberian side and three ports on the American side. These Bourbon reforms did not at first extend to Venezuela or New Spain, but these restrictions were lifted in 1788 and 1789, respectively. Of course, Charles III did not mean to apply, quote, free trade, unquote, or even, quote, freedom to trade, unquote. Indeed, his main concerns were to reduce contraband, increase tax revenue, and ensure that a greater proportion of intra-imperial trade should consist of Spanish goods. In this he was largely successful, as we shall see, but in a good example of the law of unintended consequences, the Reglamento unleashed a series of changes that would eventually lead to freedom to trade for the countries of Spanish America. The Portuguese response was at first less supportive of free trade. Indeed, the reforms enacted by the Marquis of Pombal in the 1750s created new trading monopoly companies. However, by the 1760s, policy in Portugal was taking a similar turn to that in Spain. The last state-organized fleet sailed from Portugal to Brazil in 1766, and thereafter, properly licensed ships were free to sail whenever they pleased to Salvador and Rio de Janeiro. When the Pombaline monopoly companies were disbanded after the ministers' fall from power, ships from Portugal were free to enter any Brazilian port. <coughs> 
This change made it possible for merchant navy ships to make two trips a year to Brazil with a big impact on imperial trade. What the Pombaline and subsequent reforms could not do was stop the contraband trade along Brazil's vast coastline. British ships in particular were particularly brazen about visiting Brazil without permission, with about a dozen arriving each year in the 1780s. Furthermore, British captains were quick to take advantage of the loophole under which a distressed vessel, Arribada, could put into port. In Rio de Janeiro, for example, the number of Arribadas increased from eight in 1791 to 30 in 1800, and it is unlikely that weather conditions alone accounted for the increase. Both sets of reforms, Bourbon and Pombonheim, had the intended effect of increasing not only trade itself, but also the proportion of exports to the Americas from peninsular sources. In the case of Spain, for example, this went from 38% in 1778 to 57% in 1796. This, of course, was anathema to anyone who really believed in free trade, since the increase was due to the opening of new ports rather than the application of the Ricardian law of comparative advantage. However, 1796 would mark the end of this particular phase of Spanish imperial trade, as it was also the year in which Britain and Spain went to war, with disastrous consequences for Spain. Its fleet was largely destroyed off Cape St. Vincent the following year, and Spain was in no position to supply the colonies with their essential needs, yet alone the luxury goods for which they had begun to acquire a taste. The situation was now so desperate that colonial administrators were forced to take matters into their own hands. The Intendente in Cuba, for example, gave permission to slave trading ships entering Havana to depart with whatever Cuban exports they could buy. The Spanish crown therefore bowed to the inevitable and permitted the colonies in the Americas to trade with ships of neutral countries, provided that the ships sailed to Spain with their cargoes before returning to their home ports. Britain, being at war with Spain and therefore not neutral, could not take advantage of this. However, United States ships could, although they had no intention of sailing to Spain before returning to US ports, and Spain had no means of enforcing it. The extension of trade to neutral ships was an important step in the march to, towards, quote, freedom to trade, unquote. Indeed, that is one reason why it was revoked two years later by the Spanish crown. Efforts to enforce the prohibition were hugely unpopular, and after Spain was invaded by Napoleonic forces and Charles IV abdicated in 1808, utterly ineffective, once again local officials took matters into their own hands, the most famous being the Viceroy of Buenos Aires in 1809, who gave permission for foreign ships, including British, to enter the Rio de la Plata. The Napoleonic invasion forced the Portuguese court to take refuge in Brazil. This had the support of the British, who extracted in return the right of freedom to trade for all allied and neutral countries. Within a matter of months, the foreign trade of Brazil was largely in the hands of British merchants, who used Brazil as a platform from which to penetrate other South American markets, especially the ports of Buenos Aires and Montevideo. When the Napoleonic forces were ousted from the Iberian Peninsula, it made no difference to the freedom to trade of Brazil, which was now largely in British hands. However, when Ferdinand VII ascended the Spanish throne, it was inevitable that an attempt would be made by the imperial power to reverse the advance of freedom to trade, by restricting the access of neutral ships to its ports in the Americas. Once again, however, there was little the Spanish government could do to enforce it, and this time the colonists had either declared independence or were in no mood to obey. The Captain General of Cuba, for example, refused to implement the order banning foreign ships, and by 1818 the Crown was obliged to, to open Cuban ports to unrestricted trade. Local officials in Central America and other parts of the Americas then did the same. Finally, in March 1824, Ferdinand VII promised genuine, quote, freedom to trade, unquote. But by this time, Spanish authority in the Americas had been reduced to a small part of Peru, together with the islands of Cuba and Puerto Rico. When the fighting ended, therefore, all independent countries, Brazil as well as the former Spanish colonies, started with freedom to trade. So, however, did the remaining Spanish colonies, Cuba and Puerto Rico, and the ports of Santo Domingo, occupied by Haiti in 1822, also enjoyed the same freedom to trade as the ports in the western half of Hispaniola. All countries could now import from the cheapest source and export to wherever they wanted. 
This was not, however, quote, free trade, unquote, as both imports and even more exports were subject to all sorts of discrimination by partner countries, in addition to the high tariffs and export duties applied by Latin American countries themselves. Freedom to trade brought all sorts of new trade partners into the Latin American sphere. And after recognition of the independent states, it brought back the old partners as well, Spain for most, Portugal for Brazil, and France for Haiti. However, with only a few exceptions, the new partners would prove to be more important in the long run. The old partners, with the partial exception of France and Haiti, could not provide the imports now required, nor the market for the new, or indeed, traditional exports. Of the new partners, by far the most important was the United Kingdom. Although British merchants had oversupplied the South American markets in particular after 1808, trade soon settled down to more sustainable levels. Britain would face a challenge in foodstuffs and lumber from the United States, in porcelain and other fine goods from France, and in a range of quality manufactured goods from the German states. However, British dominance lasted for some years. In 1842, for example, the United Kingdom was still responsible for half of all Brazilian imports, with France and the United States a distant second and third, respectively. And the UK was still taking nearly 30% of Brazilian exports in that year, despite its low demand for coffee and preference for colonial sugar. Britain was equally dominant in the rest of South America. In Central America, Cuba, Haiti, Mexico and Puerto Rico, however, the UK faced a serious challenge from the United States even before 1850. Before freedom to trade could become free trade for Latin America, a series of obstacles had to be overcome. Some of these had been put in place by Latin America's trade partners and would not be fully removed even by the time of the First World War. Others had been inherited by the newly independent states from Portugal and Spain, and in a few cases were made worse by post-colonial governments. The march to free trade was a long one, with many a bump along the road. The first set of obstacles was the desire of the partners to have special trade privileges that did not apply to others. Since recognition of independence was eagerly sought, the temptation for some of the partners to, de to demand such privileges in return was irresistible. And as always in trade policy, a bilateral trade deficit with a Latin American country would be seen as an opportunity by the partner to extract trade concessions. Although in a formal sense Latin American states agreed to these measures, it could not be denied that they drove a wedge through the principles of free trade, since the cheapest source of imports was often excluded from the market by discriminatory tariffs. Unsurprisingly, given its dominant position, it was the UK that was the first to exploit the opportunities for trade discrimination. Following the transfer of the Portuguese court to Brazil, a treaty of navigation and commerce was signed with Great Britain in 1810 that fixed a maximum tariff on British goods of 15%, but without reciprocity. This was the same rate as that paid by Portuguese goods entering the Brazilian market, but much lower than that of other friendly nations. This unequal treaty should have lapsed on Brazilian independence in 1822, but Britain succeeded in replacing it in 1827 with an Anglo-Brazilian commercial treaty confirming the maximum tariff for British goods of 15%, again without reciprocity. Brazil did what it could to limit the trade distorting impact by lowering tariffs on all imports in 1828 to a maximum of 15%, but this had the undesirable side effect of undermining protection for Brazilian industry. The treaty with Britain was finally ended in 1844. Great Britain did the same in Haiti in 1814, but this time without even recognizing Haitian independence. At the time, Haiti was divided in two, a kingdom in the north ruled by Henri Christophe and a republic in the south ruled by Pétion. The latter had imposed a tariff of 10%, and Britain was able to obtain a 50% reduction, but, as in the case of Brazil, without reciprocity. When Boyer united Haiti in 1820, he pressed again for British recognition. The UK, however, still refused to accept an independent Haiti on the specious grounds that it could not do so ahead of France, ignoring the fact that it had recognized the independence of the Latin American republics without waiting for Spain, the former colonial power, to do so. This so enraged President Boyer that he cancelled the trade privileges granted to the UK in 1826. 
France and Portugal, as former colonial powers, also wanted trade privileges. Portugal was too weak to extract them from Brazil, but France was able to obtain them in Haiti in 1825, following recognition of Haitian independence. She did not, however, provide reciprocity. French privileges extended to the export duties, not just import tariffs, applied by Haiti to its main exports. As a growing number of ships started calling at Haitian ports, flying the French flag, the revenue fell. Boyer wisely cancelled the French trade privileges in 1828. There would be no reciprocal Franco-Haitian trade treaty until 1904, despite the fact that most Haitian exports went to France. Spain, having little to offer by way of manufactured goods, could do nothing to extract trade privileges in its former colonies. In the Caribbean, however, it was a different matter, and a fourfold tariff system imposed on Cuba and Puerto Rico ensured the lowest tariff on Spanish goods in Spanish ships and the highest on foreign goods in foreign ships. This trade discrimination meant that the two remaining colonies were obliged to import many essential goods, especially flour, from Spain, despite the fact that other countries, especially the United States, could have supplied them much more cheaply. Spanish trade privileges in its Caribbean colonies came to an end in 1892, but this had nothing to do with a Spanish commitment to free trade. <coughs> Instead, it was due to the growing diplomatic power of the United States. The United States had signed treaties of commerce and navigation with most Latin American republics following independence. The main exception was Haiti, where the recognition was delayed until 1862 but the United States had not sought or obtained trade privileges. Instead, she had sought most favored nation status, a position with which the UK was also comfortable after the ending of trade privileges in Brazil. This position lasted until the US Civil War. However, subsequent administrations were much more aggressive in trade policy, raising tariffs sharply on imports and seeking to use the growing economic power of the United States to extract trade privileges. This came to a head in 1889 when Secretary of State James Blaine used the meeting in Washington, D.C. that would launch, eventually, the Pan-American Union to call for a customs union in the Americas. This initiative was rebuffed by the Latin American republics present, but the McKinley Tariff the following year gave the United States a new weapon. The President was now entitled to impose additional tariffs on imports from those countries not agreeing to the reciprocal trade concessions. Within two years, the Dominican Republic, Spain on behalf of Cuba and Puerto Rico, and the UK on behalf of many of its Caribbean colonies, had agreed to slash the tariff on US imports. In the Caribbean, only Haiti resisted and was punished with additional taxes. And the United States insisted that Cuba, after independence in 1902, should sign a reciprocal trade treaty, giving the US reductions on all imports in return for concessions on Cuban sugar and tobacco exports. Another obstacle in the path of free trade was the commercial policy of the European imperial powers. For Latin America, the most important of these were the UK and France. At the time of independence, both countries had in place systems of imperial preference that gave preference to colonies over foreign countries. This was an obstacle for Latin American exporters of raw sugar, wool, coffee and spices. Only cotton imports into Britain were exempt, as the duty was zero. In addition, all European countries, not just the imperial ones, operated cascading tariffs designed to protect their own industries by applying higher tariffs on processed imports such as refined sugar. The UK struggled with tariff reform for many years, briefly in 1844 imposing an additional tariff on slave-grown sugar from countries such as Brazil and Cuba. However, in 1846 the Corn Laws were abolished and an eight-year period began in which imperial preference was phased out and many tariffs, such as those on raw sugar, were reduced to zero. This was good news for those Latin American countries exporting those commodities most affected, although the duty on refined sugar would remain in the UK until 1874. At that point, the UK came close to duty-free trade, although import tariffs and excise duties were still collected on a small number of goods, especially wines and spirits. This golden age of British free trade would last until the First World War, when imperial preference was again introduced with negative consequences for many Latin American exporters. France followed a different path. In 
Combining imperial preference with outright prohibition on many goods that competed with French production, the system was significantly relaxed in 1860 in the Anglo-French Commercial Treaty of that year, but imperial preference remained. This meant, of course, that Latin American exporters of products that competed with colonial exports faced discrimination in the French market. This discrimination never ended, and indeed became worse as the 19th century advanced for two reasons. First, the French Empire expanded rapidly in Africa and Asia, bringing new sources of supply against which Latin America had to compete on unequal terms. And secondly, tariff reform in 1891 reversed the tendency towards liberalization that had taken place in France after 1860. A customs union, or Zollverein, among the German states had begun shortly after most Latin American states had become independent. However, the common external tariff was modest, so that the implied discrimination against Latin American exports was small. The low tariffs were in part designed to discourage protectionist Austria-Hungary from joining, but her defeat by Prussia in 1865 removed the need to keep import duties at moderate levels. Thus, following German unification in 1871, the tariffs moved up sharply, with a damaging effect on certain commodities exported from Latin America, such as leaf tobacco and cigars. Under these circumstances, it is not surprising that Latin American governments were under no pressure to abolish or reduce import tariffs themselves. Their main trade partners, France, Germany, the UK and the US, all made extensive use of tariffs before 1850. Even after the end of imperial preference in Britain, Cascading tariffs were still widely used to protect parts of British industry, such as refined sugar. And less important trade partners, such as Austria-Hungary, Italy, the Ottoman Empire and Russia, never had any doubts about the wisdom of protective tariffs. There was an additional reason why Latin American states remained committed to taxes on trade. Independence had disrupted colonial fiscal systems and led to the end of various income streams. Taxes on trade, imports and exports, were an obvious target, with tariffs designed to generate revenue. If such tariffs could also provide a protective function, so much the better. If some tariff rates never reached the astronomical levels in Russia or the United States, this had less to do with the arguments against high tariffs by the handful of Latin American intellectuals in favor of trade liberalization, and had much more to do with the need to keep tariffs to the level that maximize revenue. High tariffs designed for protection, of course, often generate zero revenue, as all imports are excluded. Tariffs inherited from colonial Portugal and Spain were relatively low. These were then raised quickly. By mid-19th century, after the end of the commercial treaty with Great Britain, the average tariff in Brazil, the average tariff rate in Brazil, measured by the ratio of import duties to imports, was nearly 30%. It was the same in Colombia. In Buenos Aires province, and the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata, virtually an independent country at the time, the average tariff rate was 31% in 1836. In Mexico, in the 1840s, it had already risen to 45%. By contrast, in supposedly protectionist France, the average tariff rate fell from 17% in late 1840s to 13% in the early 1850s. In Latin America, only Peru, bolstered by revenue from guano exports after 1852, was able to lower tariffs significantly. These high tariff rates could be explained by the exigencies of the post-colonial fiscal crisis, and in some cases the demands of war and civil strife. Yet as Coatsworth and Williamson have shown, they did not come down as more normal conditions prevailed. Tariff rates crept up after 1865 and by the 1890s were even higher than those in the United States if unweighted averages are used. Tariff rates averaged 30% in the last decade of the 19th century. There was even a protectionist element in these tariffs, as governments became more sensitive to the need to promote local industry against competition from imports. Yet this was in fact as close as Latin America would come to, quote, free trade, unquote, although some federal countries, such as Brazil, still applied interstate tariffs at this time. By the end of the First World War, tariff rates would rise again, and in the 1930s would be joined by a formidable arsenal of non-tariff barriers to keep out imports. <laughs>
International trade policy was not, of course, the only issue with which economic liberalism had to grapple. There were many others. The most difficult ones can be conveniently grouped around the three factor markets, labor, land, and capital. Other policy issues, such as the dismantling of state monopolies inherited from the colonial period, were less controversial. Latin America in the 19th century suffered from a scarcity of labor, meaning that the demand for labor exceeded the supply of the prevailing wage rate. Resolving this disequilibrium through an increase in wage rates was regarded by all members of the elite as anathema, since it was thought it would lead to a major loss of competitiveness. Thus, policy placed an emphasis on increasing supply. In all countries, but especially Brazil and Cuba, slaves formed part of the labor supply at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Among the slave populations, death rates almost invariably exceeded birth rates, so that the slave population could only be maintained through the slave trade. This had been abolished at first by Denmark from 1803, then by the United States from 1808, and by Britain a few weeks later. British pressure was then applied to Holland and Sweden, two other imperial powers in the Americas, to end the trade from 1814. British pressure was also applied to France, Portugal and Spain, but their resistance was great. It was not until the 1830s that France made any serious effort to stop the trade, and Spain only started to do so in the 1840s. Portugal did the same, but by now Brazil was independent and resisted fiercely all British efforts to curtail the slave trade until the 1850s. At that point, the trade was outlawed throughout the Americas, although an illegal trade to Cuba continued to them until 1873. The independent Spanish-American countries had no means of continuing the slave trade, even if they had wanted to. Furthermore, many states passed laws freeing the children of slaves. Thus, it was inevitable that slavery itself would eventually come to an end. However, emancipation in Latin America was a long, drawn-out affair, as liberals as well as conservatives agonized over the implications for labor supply. The United Provinces of Central America in 1824 were the first, closely followed by Mexico in 1829. Other countries followed suit, the last being Puerto Rico in 1873, Cuba in 1880, and Brazil in 1888. Generally, slavery lasted longer, the greater the proportion of slaves in the working population, suggesting that humanitarian considerations were not the crucial factor in emancipation. With slavery ending, the scarcity of labor became more acute. Coercion, therefore, continued to be used by the state, although this time without slavery. The policy options included debt peonage, indentured labor, and anti-vagrancy laws. All these policies, while deeply illiberal, were implemented by supposedly liberal governments, as well as their conservative opponents. No contradiction was seen between liberalism as a political philosophy and labor market coercion as a policy tool. It was only towards the end of the century, when free inward migration on a large scale became realistic, that liberalism and economic policy could be more closely aligned. And even then, liberals saw no contradiction between their belief in the free market and the use of state subsidies to promote immigration. The market for land was also problematic for economic liberalism. With an abundance of land, Latin American governments were concerned with two things. First, turning existing land holdings to more productive uses, and secondly, ensuring that the mass of the population could not withdraw from the labor force by retreating into subsistence farming. Liberals had no problem with the alienation of church land, as it could be argued that it was now not only more productive, but had increased the power of the state against the ecclesiastical authorities. Communal land, important in those countries with a large indigenous population, was another matter altogether. The transfer of such lands to private ownership was pursued vigorously by liberals, despite the apparent contradiction with personal freedoms. However, for liberals, the need to secure a labor force for the expanding export sectors became an issue that overrode all other considerations. The alienation of communal land served liberal aims well, as it expanded private land holdings in productive areas, ensured an increase in labor supply, and generated tax revenues through the increase in international trade. The remaining factor market capital was less contentious. Almost all members of the elite shared a conviction that foreign capital, both direct and portfolio, was a necessary condition for the growth and development of the region.
Only in Haiti did the elite reject this assumption. Frequent debt crises, starting in the 1820s, made it difficult to attract foreign capital, but the conviction that it was needed remained. When liberals came to power, they were among the most assiduous in courting foreign investment, even if this meant providing a guaranteed rate of return on capital. <coughs> the extreme version of this liberal faith in foreign capital was provided by Porfirio Diaz in Mexico. In the decade before the Porfiriato, Mexico had experienced a series of disastrous investments by local capitalists in key infrastructure projects that never came to fruition. Only foreign capitalists, such as Wheatman Pearson, were now seen as capable of delivering successful outcomes. The Cientificos around Diaz, especially José Pimentor, were quite capable of driving a shrewd bargain with foreign capitalists, but they never wavered in their belief that only foreign investment could rescue Mexico from decades of underperformance. Much the same was true of Central America, the Dominican Republic, and many South American states. By the end of the 19th century, economic liberalism had succeeded in many of its names, aims. The export sector was expanding rapidly, producing commodities needed by the industrialized countries of Europe and North America. Tax revenues were booming, aided by the rise in imports made possible by export expansion. Public spending on issues close to liberal hearts, such as education, was also on the rise. Yet it had taken a long time for this virtual cir virtuous circle to come into place. And within a few years of the new century starting, it would be broken, first by the Great War, and then by the Great Depression. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, for an excellent uh, and far-ranging um, presentation which covers many of the issues uh, that were raised today in the workshop, and um, it was very good to hear your distinctive take on this. I mean, I suppose I'd like to start just by asking you one question, if I may, before opening up the floor. There is an argument about um, the importance of securing liberalism uh, for the development of capitalism. What would be your uh, view on the record of Latin American period you're discussing in terms of securing or not securing the conditions? Sounds as if Latin America's very hybrid response to liberalism in the economy uh, and the contradictions that you lay out could well be interpreted as one of the reasons, at least by some people, why uh, Latin American capitalism perhaps is you know, less successful at that time. I would have thought that the, that the key was um, the absence of war, both interstate and, and, and civil war. I mean, a country that uh, is in turmoil in, in the sense that uh, uh, there is uh, fighting in the country or between countries is in no position to uh, uh, promote uh, uh, capitalism at all, yet alone the kind that comes with um, foreign investment. So that's a sort of necessary condition. And a number of countries, as you know, didn't meet that necessary condition for large parts of the 19th century. Um, once you've secured that necessary condition, I'm not sure that it makes much difference whether the government in power carries the label liberal or conservative. Because as you saw in, in what I just said and you heard in the workshop this afternoon, actually implementing a coherent policy of economic liberalism in, in 19th century Latin America was very difficult, if not impossible. And not just in Latin America. There are inherent contradictions, I think, in uh, in what that um, particular phrase actually means. Right, now let's open it up to the floor. Anybody would like to start with questions, comments? Yes, Alex. Um, when you, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy it greatly, and I wish I would be able to summarize not just my, yeah, you know, uh, changes in policies and so on, but so much historiography as well. Uh, so you started, I, I had a funny reaction to some description of Spanish uh, lack of uh, free uh, trade, freedom of, freedom of trade. And um, I, I would like to, to know um, how would you describe these changes in the British, uh, for, for Britain as such. When, when you depict it somehow, uh, show the portrayal of Spanish or Portuguese uh, lack of 
freedom of trade or to trade. There's very the sort of uh, uh, restrictions to the number of ports, a single uh, monopoly for a company, uh, that they travel in fleets. And you were describing the British India Company, the English East India Company, very much in the same plan. So you gave us a very nice um, uh, narrative of the changes or how Latin America play uh, within this freedom of trade. But when, how is it, I mean, it is so much a British take on uh, the conditions to trade or um, why Latin America would have done differently given the conditions they had and they had to face at the time? Well, that's a very interesting point. I mean, the, the parallels between the Ibero-American uh, Ibero system and, and the British India uh, system, of course, there's one big difference, and that is at the time, India was not a colony. It was, um, uh, um, it had, at least not theoretically, not officially, not legally a colony, so that the East India Company had special privileges uh, precisely because it wasn't uh, a colony. And we all know what the consequences of that were with the opium wars and all the rest of that. Uh, but when trading with their colonies in uh, the Americas, uh, of course, uh, there was no um, uh, monopoly system as far as uh, um, imports and exports were concerned. So there was a big difference in, in that sense. And the same was true of the French. The Danish did have uh, the Danish West India Company, which for a long time had a monopoly on trade with the Danish colonies in the Caribbean. But that came to an end um, in the late uh, 18th century, before the application of the Bourbon reform. So it's not, a, I hope, a, a, a sort of biased British view of, 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 uh, of what was happening in Spain. I think there really was uh, uh, a case to be made that Spain and perhaps to a lesser extent Portugal were behind the curve when it came to uh, freedom to trade in the, um, in the late 18th century. But they got there in the end. And um, if uh, uh, Latin America had not won its independence from uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, one assumes that the evolution of trade would have taken a very similar form to what it did in uh, the UK and France, even if uh, they wouldn't necessarily have gone as far as Britain did in <coughs> reducing tariffs themselves. <coughs> Um, I have two questions. One, when, when I was a graduate student um, many years ago, we were actually taught that Latin America had been one of the most liberal areas of the world in terms of trade. And um, although I agree with a lot of what you're um, saying here, it's more accurate in, in terms of historiography. The question I have is, how did that reputation emerge? of Latin America as, as one of the poles of, of economic liberalism in the world economy. Second question is, um, um, let's say the conditions had existed at independence for stable states and governments, and these governments had, in fact, adopted fairly consistent free, trading, uh, free trade policies in your terms. Um, but not to change much of the social constitution um, that was um, inherited from the colonial regime, caste divisions and inequality and land tenure and whatnot. How different do you think Latin America would have looked either from an economic um, or social perspective, say, a century later, at the beginning of the 20th century? Well, the two questions are clearly linked. Um, I think. Uh, the answer to the first question is relatively simple. I think people were just lazy and didn't do their homework. And uh, had they done their homework, they would have very quickly seen that uh, average tariff rates in Latin America, as um, John Coatsworth and others have demonstrated, were actually pretty high. They were not extremely high, but they were pretty high. And so the idea that this was you know, the most liberal uh, trading 
power in the world was, when you reflect about it, fairly absurd. But, um, of course, that comes on to the second part of your question, which is, uh, why was that the case? And the answer comes back to what we were talking about this afternoon, which was there really was no alternative to uh, customs duties as a source of government revenue. And it's interesting that uh, this is true, not just of uh, so-called weak states that struggle to uh, collect uh, revenue on a more diversified basis, but also relatively strong states, such as Imperial Brazil, or even colonial Cuba and Puerto Rico, as it, as it happens, um, uh, who also collected most of their revenue from, uh, from customs duties. And clearly, if that is the only way, that I means Having a, a state, a functioning state, is going to take precedence over everything else. It doesn't matter how elegant your arguments in favour of uh, free trade and laissez-faire are, you have to have a functioning state. And if the only way you can get that is by having taxes on, uh, on, on, uh, on um, foreign trade, then so be it. Of course, if you're lucky, foreign trade is booming uh, for reasons that have, may have nothing to do with uh, your economic policies, but maybe simply a function of the commodity luxury, uh, then you can afford to have relatively low tariffs and you get into a, a virtuous circle. But if you're unlucky, and um, many Latin American countries were unlucky in that sense, you're stuck with fairly high tariffs and you have to live with that in terms of what it means for um, 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 uh, an open trading system. It doesn't mean it's a closed trading system, it just doesn't mean it's as open as as we were led to believe when we were graduate students. It's, and uh, I remember that very well. Now, the second point, of course, is then, well, imagine the, uh, a hypothetical situation where they had been able to uh, operate with low uh, taxes on trade um, uh, in the way that Britain did after 1846 or France after 1860. Uh, but they had a uh, social order which was uh, uh, rather different to the one they had. Well, remember, the only way they could have that would be by having a strong enough state to derive uh, these non-trade taxes in an effective way. And that's a huge assumption. That is a huge assumption. I mean, if you look around the world in the 1830s, 40s, or 50s, there are very, very few countries in a position to do that. Um, uh, you are coming down to uh, forms of administrative control, such as head taxes in villages and uh, tribute and, uh, and all the rest of it, which uh, were either anathema to independent states or simply too difficult to implement. So I, I, I'm struggling to actually even imagine what that hypothetical question would look like because uh, I can't really see any alternative to the one which they ended up with, which is rely on customs duties to fund anything between a half and two thirds of, uh, of, uh, uh, of state revenue. Yes, if any were commodities, the fact that Latin American countries were like mainly uh, commodity exporters, do you think that have a specific role in you know, this situation or there is no role at all? And if it's, you say that because they have to get the tax revenue from exports, do you think that this is also related with uh, uh, the fact that they could export commodities, which was kind of well, commodities are clearly the link between Latin America and the rest of the world. In fact, they still are, um, uh, even more so in the last 10 years than they were in the previous uh, 20. So, but that's nothing uh, uh, surprising. It's true. It was true of the United States until the Civil War, to a very large extent. And it is certainly true of Africa and Asia and, uh, and, and just about everywhere else. Uh, except one or two European countries, including the UK. So the idea that you're, you're linked with the outside world is commodities, that's just, you just take that for granted, and there really wasn't any alternative to that. Um, of course, commodities are exports. Uh, I mean, you, you, you export these commodities, but you don't have to tax them 
what you have to do is tax the imports that those exports pay for. You only tax exports under exceptional circumstances when you have some sort of market power or monopoly, such as uh, uh, the Chileans had with nitrates or the uh, Peruvians had with guano. But even that, most of the revenue tends to come from um, uh, the imports that the, um, the exports uh, uh, pay for. Um, you asked another question. I'm sorry, what was it? No, but, yeah, so what I mean, what's the commodities? The fact that they almost specialized, they are still specialized on commodities, was it positive or negative, what do you think? Of? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, you have to say, you can't really answer that because there was no choice. I mean, the alternative would have been autarky, a closed economic system, and there had been various attempts to romanticize Paraguay under Dr. Francia or Guatemala under Rafael Carrera, but it, listen, this is nonsense. The fact is that uh, uh, even these cases uh, of so-called closed economies were not really closed, and uh, uh, you could not function as an independent Latin American state without having... Well, what you can say uh, is that sometimes you could be uh, uh, lucky and sometimes you could be unlucky in terms of the commodities that you had to export. And sometimes you could manage them well, and sometimes you could manage them badly. And sometimes you could use the resources intelligently, and sometimes you could use them foolishly. Now, all of that is true. And there's a man sitting behind you who knows all about Peru, who would give you a, a, a many examples, a, a many Peruvian specialists in here, because it represents the very best of, uh, of how you can get things right and how you can get things wrong. And Peru is still living through this uh, cycle of commodity booms, and whether this one will be more successful than the previous one, we will have to see. Alan? You describe the sort of charting the progression of free trade externally, which seems to me probably the uh, most straightforward, and it can indeed be measured, and you said people got it wrong, and now you know, the picture is rather clearer than it was. The progression, I don't want to make it sound teleological, but the progression towards domestic free trade or economic liberalism is more complicated and could take many forms, some of which we discussed today, abolishing corporate land tenure, Alcabala's internal customs and so on. But one of the things you particularly mentioned, which seems to be very crucial, is the labor market and the fact that, which I mean, it looks paradoxical, perhaps it isn't, but external free trade may in some cases seem to go with, correlate, or even produce highly illiberal labor markets, slavery being the obvious case, but you mentioned P and and land at the end and so on. Whereas in some other cases, you do seem to get a more virtuous circle where external free trade and increased uh, integration of world markets seem to produce domestic free trade in the labor market, particularly with you know, intense migration flows of largely free labor. So can you develop a bit how does that, because that looks to me quite a sort of big divergence within Latin America, which has all sorts of social and political consequences. So, I mean, I suppose the obvious answer is to do with the size of your population is made to do with the ethnicity of your population. Can you develop a bit well, and also, how that yeah. comes about? I mean, it, it, clearly, the, 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 the first thing is that if you're very successful uh, in foreign trade, it does increase the demand for labor. So you're going to have to find that labor from somewhere. And uh, unless there's been a change in um, birth and death rates, then it's going to have to come through either internal coercion or uh, net migration. And I think Cuba is, in the 19th century is a fascinating illustration of, of this problem because they tried everything. I mean, their, their export boom was so enormous up to the 1870s that they were constantly struggling to uh, resolve the, uh, the shortage of labor. So they used the illegal slave trade, uh, they used indentured labor from China, they used uh, indentured labor from Yucatan, as you know. They used uh, uh, free labor from the Canary Islands and uh, other parts of, um, of, of Spain. They tried everything. And, and in a way, you could say that uh, 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 th these efforts resolved the problem in the narrow sense of, of the shortage of labor. But what's interesting is the debates in Cuba, there was never any sense that you could rely on one to the exclusion of the other. Of course, it's all mixed up with issues of race and having the right balance between black and white and all that sort of stuff, right? 
But the fact is that there's very little evidence that anyone in Cuba thought that they could just rely on one form, and in particular, nobody was convinced until very late in the day that they could rely on free um, uh, uh, white uh, uh, migration from uh, um, 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 from from Europe. Uh, I guess in um, other parts of the world, uh, there was, if you like, a hope, a preference that they could resolve the shortages of labour through um, free migration. And that's why you see all sorts of countries, uh, you have the ambassador of El Salvador, so Salvador is a very good example of how they went bent over backwards in the late 19th century to offer the most extraordinarily generous terms for free migrant labour. But they never got up. It just did not arrive in, in sufficient quantities. And at that point, coercion kicks in. If you're lucky and you do, as in Argentina, get enough, uh, and Uruguay, you get enough uh, 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 labor coming through uh, free migration, or indeed in the United States, then uh, you don't have to worry so much about coercion. And I just think that's the, the way in which this problem was approached. Colin, I'm very much persuaded by your wide ranging and nuanced argument. But just a couple of, of queries or objections. Uh, first on revenue tariffs, uh, and secondly on contraband trade. Now it seems to me that in your responses to none of the questions, you've moved a little from the way that you presented the case about uh, revenue tariffs in your in your paper. I mean, we know that many of our uh, new institutionalist colleagues would see all tariffs as illiberal and a restraint on trade. But I think that as you've acknowledged in responding to some of the questions, 19th century liberals would have had no difficulty whatsoever with revenue tariffs, yeah? so long as they were exclusively revenue tariffs and never crept into that sort of uh, beyond the frontier or the margin of being protected. Because it was accepted that there was no other way of financing the state other than through uh, tariffs, whether they were taxes on exports, uh, more usually taxes on, on, on imports. So I think that there is a certain sort of dichotomy in terms of how a number of the recent contributors to the debate about tariffs see tariffs, see revenue tariffs, and the way in which you've now developed the, the argument uh, in response to the questions. My second uh, observation might be more controversial. Um, in the latter part of the 20th century, there was a tendency among some to present the informal sector as a route to the market. Yeah? By definition, the informal sector was a way of escaping excessive state regulations, you know, whether they were taxes on production, whether they were labor taxes. That in, in a sense, the informal sector represented the market, you know, raw uh, in, in tooth and nail. I just wonder if contraband in the late 18th and the early 19th century might not be presented in a similar way. You know, contraband was the market. Contraband was the market at work, and contraband signaled the route to the market. I'm not so sure you Well, uh, um, let me let just quickly on your first point. Uh, I'm not, of course, disagreeing with you at all. It's uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on the commercial policy of the trade partners, in particular Britain, France, Germany, and the United States, was to show that all these countries, including the UK, made heavy use of tariffs. I mean, we, we have grown up with this mythology that in 1846 Britain abolished tariffs. It didn't do anything of the sort. It abolished imperial preference, and it abolished the, the, tra the, the tariff on basic grains, but it didn't abolish tariffs. And even after 1874, there were still some tariffs. There's a wonderful book by a guy called Nye, not Joseph Nye, not the soft power man, but he <laughs> compares uh, commercial policy in Britain and France uh, in the 19th century, and he finds that actually the average British tariff was slightly higher, even in the last quarter of the 19th century. Neither was very high, but Britain wasn't this great um, uh, paradise of uh, laissez-faire free trade, that other countries should have aspired to. And therefore, if Britain wasn't implementing zero tariffs, why on earth should any Latin American country? I mean, that's really the point I'm trying to make. And I think we're on the same wavelength as far as that's concerned, because there was no alternative, to quote somebody else. 
who <laughs> used to sit in this room from time to time. Um, as for your second point, I, my instinct is to say no. My instinct is to say no. And I'm trying to think if I can formulate that in a sort of sophisticated way that would impress you. I'm not sure I can. I think the fact that it's trade and um, the imports are coming from another country as opposed to the informal sector, which is clearly domestic, indigenous, and all the rest of it, is a, is a huge difference. And, uh, uh, um, and remember that contraband trade often is very consistent with monopoly. <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, ferocious competition for landing ships in the middle of the night at certain destinations. There's also an element of monopoly about the way it was conducted. There are certain favoured partners, certain favoured locations, certain favoured individuals and all the rest of it. So, no, I'm, 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 no, I think you'll have trouble explaining that. Uh, Rory. Just um, thinking, Victor, about some of the points you made early on about the immediate post independence period when, as you say, the usual instrument was a treaty of, uh, of trade and navigation. Whether perhaps we forget the navigation bit of that when we're telling the story. Uh, but one important aspect of British pressure, it seems to me, in the early 19th century was trying to open up rivers, particularly the Plate and the Amazon. And one important aspect of some countries' protectionism at the end of the 19th century, I think, was trying to protect coastal shipping and trying to subsidise their own shipping industries. But I think we maybe too easily forget the navigation part of, of, of the story. Very good point. Absolutely. And uh, I remember examining a very good PhD in Sweden about the coastal trade in Chile and how it was protected right through the 19th century. And that was the basis of a... Uh, strong um, you know, shipbuilding industry and all the rest of it. Uh, and it's one of those areas that the United States has never opened up. Um, it's, it's absolutely you know, off limits when it comes to uh, freedom to trade. So I think that's a very good point and I'll, I'll take it on board. Any more? Yes? Sorry, I can't see who it is. Please go Sorry, ahead. Sorry, I wasn't at the workshop, so I hope I don't repeat the question, but I was just wondering what the role of um, towards the end of the century in uh, sort of economic liberalism in Latin America, what role there was for the gold standard. In a sense, it's one of the key ideas that British liberals have about regulating international trade. Is, do you get a similar? Well, it was one of these who discussed uh, at, the, oh. at the workshop, but that's no reason why you shouldn't ask it. I mean, uh, uh, clearly, the, the monetary system uh, is, is, is very difficult to link to economic liberalism as such. It was discussed in some detail this afternoon. And um, you find different constituencies in countries, many of whom would probably call themselves economic liberals, favoring one monetary system over another. So there was no real consensus. Having said that, uh, the gold standard was attempted at various points by various countries, sometimes successfully, sometimes uh, not so successfully. You know, I mean, the gold standard is like the Eurozone. It imposes really tough conditions on members, and sometimes it's not always possible to meet those conditions, and then you have difficulties, you should say. Uh, Latin America was, was no exception, um, but there were periods before the First World War when it worked. It worked in Mexico for a short while, it worked in Argentina for a longer period. Um, there was, um, uh, it, it's, it's been well researched, but as I said, it's, it's very difficult to say this is economic liberalism, whereas a, a, a silver a standard or a bimetallic standard or a paper standard was not economic liberalism. I don't think you can really say that. Alex. Well, it seems like a, the other half of that question. Uh, in assessing the virtues or the vices or the problems or shortcomings of liberalism, of uh, liberalizing the commercial policy, um, I guess that there are very different instances in which either protectionism or the, the, expect, the desired effects might have worked or not. 
Uh, one is this question about uh, opening the interior market, sort of the markets beyond the port, and that is the case of the River Rhine uh, expedition. But also is the question with the currency or the monetary standard in place. Because at least for the cases I remember, uh, that I know, the I mean, the taxes on trade was very different levied on export than import. So, to what extent there was a concern at the time on the protective or lack of protection needs to affect from currencies in, you know, the uh, devalued currencies? <coughs> and what were the distributional effects within from how you get a different tariff for exports and imports? Well, I mean, clearly, you can only impose export duties under high export duties, I'm not talking about 1 or 2 percent, under exceptional circumstances, otherwise you just price yourself out of the... If you're a price taker as opposed to a price maker, you just can't have a 30 percent tax on export duties. Um, it, it makes you uncompetitive. Um, so it's not surprising that most revenue came uh, from import duties, but remember that it's the exports that are paying for the imports, so in a way, um, uh, that there is an important export element in this story. I think, uh, I don't know the answer, Alejandra, um, but I'm always struck, the more I read and the older I get, how many cases there are of governments in 19th century Latin America responding to uh, <coughs> lobbying by particular sectors, you know, uh, here's a flour mill, can we have a higher tariff? Yes, okay. Um, I, I rather like Paul, you know, as a, as a graduate student, we didn't expect this sort of thing. It wasn't supposed to happen, but I keep coming across these cases. You've illustrated them in many cases for, for, for Lima, Paul, and I came across several for Argentina under, under, um, in the uh, 1830s and 40s. So I suspect there's a, there's a lot more work to be done in this area. And um, uh, I think we'll probably end up with a rather messy picture where you get tariff changes according to lobbying rather than as a response to particular currency regimes. Except, of course, later on, after the big rise in prices in the First World War, when there is a systematic effort to raise uh, specific tariffs in order to provide restore the protection that was lost by rising prices when you don't have the Oran tariffs. So they were summoned to the colonial privileges and exemptions, somehow? Uh, yes, but that sounds, uh, you, you're making it sound like uh, it's just the status quo ante. Of course, it's, it's not as extreme as that. It just means that governments are governments, and even if they wouldn't necessarily qualify as very democratic. They still do respond to lobbying by, uh, by key groups, but it isn't necessarily going back to the situation um, before independence. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, Victor. Um, it's very late approach <coughs> that we live in trade, then it's very good to look back at the, at the 19th century for a lot of the things that perhaps we're living in nowadays. One of the things that struck me is that you talked about uh, United Provinces of Central America and of course also the United Provinces of um, uh, Rio de la Plata. To what extent, you know, trade or freedom to trade for that matter then had any linkages with this initial sort of like federal states, you know, was it a positive uh, factor, was it a negative factor? It seems like in the case of the United States it really worked uh, as, as a positive factor to, to make the original colonies integrate um, as a whole country. But it seems like in the case of Latin America, then it just didn't quite work the same way. What, so what's, um, what's I'd have to think about that. Um, I'm not sure that there would be a link. I think the, the bigger issue is whether uh, federal states were slower as indeed they were, than centralized states to remove internal barriers to trade. Uh, so we know that these um, barriers continued in Mexico for much of the 19th century. They continued in Brazil into the 20th century. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure they continued in Argentina, certainly up to 1860 in Argentina, and, and Alejandro would know, but possibly beyond that. So I think the problem there was not so much that the external trade policy was somehow different from that of centralized states, it's more that the internal trade policy was different, and that is because um, sub-state states or, or provinces, if you like, within federal systems need revenue, and so they had to uh, find the easiest way of taxing it, and just as the federal government, um, classic case in the United States federal government, found the easiest way to do it was through taxes on external trade, so the states found the easiest way was to tax uh, interstate transfers, and uh, that made it very difficult to, uh, to remove them. And so there was a sort of mismatch, if you like, between internal trade policy and federal systems and external trade policy. That took a long time to, to sort out. Well, I think that's probably uh, enough to ask you if there are any questions from we had a, a vigorous Q&A, and I think we want to continue this discussion, which I'm sure many of us will continue it. There are drinks uh, uh, at the end of the room here. Please join us for that. But also, please join me in thanking Victor for an excellent Q&A and lecture.